Now, people often have a lack of knowledge about spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare. You're going to go to war. You're going to go to war. You're going to God go to has war. made available to us all of the necessary resources and the tools that enable us to fight. You're going to war. To war. To war. You are called, qualified, and equipped to handle spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare. Believers are always in a state of spiritual warfare, light against darkness, truth against error, Satan against Christ, the flesh against the spirit. But there comes a time when it's much more intense. God opened my eyes to spiritual warfare on a whole nother level. We gird up your loins, because it's going to be a fight. You're going to deal with spiritual warfare, literally. Hogwash! I'm coming here and let me tell you what God said. You got a Bible. Get your nose in the Bible and start fighting the warfare like a good soldier of Christ. Somebody give God praise if you believe that this morning. With your time when the believer goes on the war path. Stand firm. Buckle on the breastplate of righteousness. Grab the shield of faith. Gird up your loins. Welcome back. I'm Wes Blaze. For me, growing up in the 90s meant trips to the arcade and home gaming consoles for weekend entertainment. Fighting games were always a favorite, but since growing in my faith, I'm no longer amused by the kind of violence and gore they so often glorify. However, the concept of selecting a character to be your good guy and going toe-to-toe -to -toe with them against the forces of darkness. That's an idea that stuck with me. I was always inspired by the thought of a battle between good and evil and the need for a hero to rise against the ranks of wickedness who oppress the innocent. If you're somebody who was raised with these type of games and were likewise influenced by the legends of heroes and villains, you can relate to the theme and to the heart of this presentation. My hope is that this information will be useful to you in this mortal life to assist you in combat so that you can know that you fight the good fight. Fight the good fight. Fight the good fight. It has begun! Fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Before many witnesses. good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. If you're here, it's because you received an invitation to prepare for a tournament of realms. A battle of biblical proportions is underway, and combatants everywhere are being beckoned to contend for the fate of their souls. Due to the escalating nature of the spiritual combat on the horizon, this special edition of the series will focus exclusively on material that the masses are not privy to. You are being expedited to a briefing on advanced knowledge as dictated by an ancient brotherhood. The biblical faith is a faith in the God of the forefathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob fathered 12 sons, and these 12 sons became the namesakes for the 12 tribes within God's family of Israel. Each of the 12 imparted instruction and wisdom to their descendants that has been preserved by the grace of God, only to resurface for a time when it can be immensely valuable for a generation of believers in the perils of spiritual warfare. shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death 
is swallowed up in victory, in victory, in victory. The Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs. This is a, a unique collection of books about the Twelve Sons of Jacob, and they're basically their deathbed testimonies. Is that right, Ken? When we go back to the beginning of Exodus, we see the names of all the brothers and then that they just die. You, you don't get a lot of speaking parts for you know the, the Twelve Sons, which I think is tragic because these guys carried on the faith. This book is essential to know because it will take you back to the beginning of Israel, how Israel was started on the right foundation by the 12 sons of Jacob, fulfilling prophecy of Abraham, that they were gonna start a nation that had strong faith in God, and also that they obeyed God. We get 12 specific names of the gates of the New Jerusalem, right? Named after these 12 sons of Israel. How did they get such names and such honor to be applied to this city of God? And it's like, we don't even get at any of their <laughs> their life, any, any type of information regarding their righteousness or any of their deeds. I've always wondered why do they have such a privilege to be even applied to the city of God? And this is why I think the Testament of the 12 Patriarchs is such a cool book to have. It used to be in the Oscan Armenian Orthodox Bible, this Testament to the Twelve Patriarchs. It was written in Hebrew. It was translated by the Bishop of Lincoln in the UK in the 13th century from Hebrew into Latin. And then R.H. Charles in 1907 translated it from Latin into English. Whomever compiled the Dead Sea Scrolls thought that these books were valid to be put together as a source of reading and understanding. And that was the deal because we've had the Greek versions for a long time and everybody said they're Christian fiction. You know, but now Dead Sea Scrolls discovered by Israelis, identical to what we have in Greek, now we gotta look at this again. Get over here! <laughs> Hear ye children the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine. Forsake ye not my law, my law, my law. Reuben. The Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs proceeds in order of birth, beginning with the oldest. Reuben is the firstborn son of Jacob and Leah. The Testament of Reuben begins as follows. The copy of the Testament of Reuben, even the commands which he gave his sons before he died in the 125th year of his life, two years after the death of Joseph his brother, when Reuben fell ill, his sons and his sons' sons were gathered together to visit him. And he said to them, My children, behold, I am dying, and go the way of my fathers. And seeing there Judah and Gad and Asher his brethren, he said to them, Raise me up, that I may tell to my brethren and to my children what things I have hidden in my heart. For behold, now at length I am passing away. These ancient Israelite scriptures are the dying confessionals, testimonies, and admonishments of the twelve sons of Jacob to their children. As with most of his brothers, Reuben begins by gathering his children to his deathbed for his final words. This way of being honored by their sons in their last moments was a practice that was also observed with their fathers Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham before them. The testament of Reuben is predominantly concerned with warning his sons against lust, and fornication. He confesses his sin of having lain with Bilhah, the concubine of his father Jacob. This is a detail that's only briefly mentioned in Genesis 35:22, but it will help make sense of Reuben's confession to his sons. And he arose and kissed them, and said unto them, Hear, my brethren, and do ye, my children, give ear to Reuben your father in the commands which I give unto you. And behold, I call to witness against you this day the God of heaven that ye walk not in the sins of youth and fornication, wherein I was poured out and defiled the bed of my father Jacob. And I tell you, he smote me with a sore plague in my loins for seven months. And had not my father Jacob prayed for me to the Lord, the Lord would have destroyed me. For I was thirty years old 
when I wrought the evil thing before the Lord, and for seven months I was sick unto death. And after this I repented with set purpose of my soul for seven years before the Lord. And so perisheth every young man, darkening his mind from the truth, and not understanding the law of God, nor obeying the admonitions of his fathers, as befell me also in my youth. And now, my children, love the truth, and it will preserve you. Hear ye the words of Reuben your father. For a pit unto the soul is the sin of fornication, separating it from God, and bringing it near to idols, because it deceiveth the mind and understanding and leadeth young men into Hades before their time. For many hath fornication destroyed, because though a man be old or noble or rich or poor, he bringeth reproach upon himself with the sons of men and derision with Belial. In the modern Protestant canon of the Bible, Belier is a word we also see in 2 Corinthians 6.15, sometimes translated as Belial, but it first appears in Deuteronomy 13.13. 13. Certain men, the children of Belial, are gone out from among you, and have withdrawn the inhabitants of their city, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which ye have not known. The word Belier is defined as an epithet or another name for the rebellious angel Satan. This is the patriarch's preferred moniker for the devil that will be used in all the testaments moving forward. Reuben follows up with this reassurance. For ye heard regarding Joseph how he guarded himself from a woman and purged his thoughts from all fornication and found favor in the sight of God and men. For the Egyptian woman did many things unto him, and summoned magicians, and offered him love potions. But the purpose of his soul admitted no evil desire. Therefore the God of your fathers delivered him from every evil and hidden death. For if fornication overcomes not your mind, neither can Belia overcome you. So, brothers and sisters, flee from fornication and cleave to our Lord, becoming one in spirit with Him to combat the spiritual attacks of the enemy. Simeon The second son of Jacob and Leah is Simeon. His testament primarily addresses the sin of envy. This sort of jealous hatred can consume a man, leading to covetousness, thefts, and even murder, bringing destruction to both the man that envies and the object of his envy. We know from Acts 7-9 that it was because the patriarchs became jealous of Joseph, they sold him into Egypt. Simeon has this to say with his dying breath. And now, my children, listen to me, and be cautious of the spirit of deceit and envy. For envy rules over a man's entire mind and afflicts him to neither eat or drink, nor to do anything good. But it strongly persuades him to destroy the man he envies. And as long as he that is envied flourishes, he that does envy the man fades away. For that reason, I afflicted my soul with fasting for two years in the fear of Yahweh, and I learnt that deliverance from envy comes by fearing God. For if a man flees to Yahweh, the evil spirit will flee from him, and his mind is spiritually enlightened. And from that time on, he sympathizes with the man whom he envied, and forgives those who are hostile to him, and doing so terminates his envy. My children, do this as well. Love each other with a good heart, and the spirit of envy will withdraw from you. For this, jealousy and envy, makes the soul fierce and destroys the body. It causes anger and creates war in the mind. It stirs up the mind and leads it to do deeds involving blood, and brings the mind into a frenzy, and causes tumult to the soul and trembling to the body. For even while you are asleep, malicious jealousy gnaws away and with wicked spirits the soul is disturbed, and causes the body to be troubled, 
and wakes the mind from its sleep in great confusion. And as a wicked and poisonous spirit, so it appears to men. This faithful forefather prescribed an antidote to anyone facing a spiritual battle against the spirits of jealousy and the associated restlessness or night terrors. That antidote is to love your fellow man according to the loving instructions of God. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. And a godly love is patient, kind, and is not jealous. The Testament of Levi is one of the longest in the Testaments. It deals with the error of arrogance and pride. It also contains Levi's account of his visions through the multiple heavens, apocalyptic prophecy, and themes of the priesthood of God with which Levi was blessed. The priestly patriarch and an angel of the Lord have this exchange. And I said to him, I pray thee, O Lord, tell me thy name, that I may call upon thee in a day of tribulation. And he said, I am the angel who intercedeth for the nation of Israel, that they may not be smitten utterly. For every evil spirit attacketh it. Evil spirit attacketh it. Evil spirit attacketh it. When this heavenly guardian responds to Levi, he is sure to let him know that God's family of Israel is specifically targeted by unclean and demonic spirits. It is in the nature of these wicked disembodied beings to afflict, oppress, destroy, attack, do battle, and work destruction on the earth. As they are allotted to the portion of Satan, they likewise do the works of the Prince of Darkness. So Levi pleads with his sons. And now, my children, ye have heard all. Choose, therefore, for yourselves either the light or the darkness, either the law of the Lord or the works of Belial. And his sons answered him, saying, Before the Lord we will walk according to his law. This passage is one of many that stands out as extremely similar to the words of the later prophets and apostles. One example being Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 6, 14-15. What partnership can righteousness have with lawlessness? What fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony exists between the Messiah and Baliar? That contrast of light versus darkness is replete throughout the books of the Bible, and the concept of light is repeatedly used to represent godly works of righteousness, whereas darkness, the absence of light, is symbolic of sinful acts of lawlessness. Contrary to popular opinion, the determining factor that defines the difference between these sets of behaviors is in fact the same eternal law of God that was taught by angels to many of the patriarchs, even before Moses. Understanding the everlasting nature of God's commandments and their ongoing applicability to his people is absolutely necessary for the advancement of our training in spiritual warfare. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. From the fourth son of Jacob and Leah, the Testament of Judah is primarily concerned with courage and contending against monetary greed, drunkenness, and fornication. His warning advises future generations to avoid lustful thinking, arrogance, and to keep from becoming a drunkard. And I know what evils you will do in the last days. Beware, therefore, my children, of fornication and the love of money, and hearken to Judah your father. For these things withdraw you from the law of God, and blind the inclination of the soul, and teach arrogance, and suffer not a man to have compassion upon his neighbor. They rob his soul of all goodness, and oppress him with toils and troubles, and drive away sleep from him, and devour his flesh. And he hinders the sacrifices of God, and he remembers not the blessing of God. He hearkens not to a prophet when he speaks, and resents the words of godliness. For he is a slave to two contrary passions, and cannot obey God, because they have blinded his soul, and he walks in the day as in the night. My children, the love of money leads to idolatry, because when led astray through money, men name as gods those who are not gods, and it causes him who has it to fall into madness. For the sake of money I lost my children, and had not my repentance and my humiliation and the prayers of my father been accepted, I should have died childless. But the God of my fathers had mercy on me, because I did it in ignorance 
and the prince of deceit blinded me, and I sinned as a man in his flesh, being corrupted through sins, and I learned my own weakness while thinking myself invincible. If the prince of deceit deceived even the namesake of the tribe of Judah, then we too must guard ourselves against the father of all lies and his spirits of deception. No, therefore, my children, that two spirits wait upon man, the spirit of truth and the spirit of deceit. And in the midst is the spirit of understanding of the mind to which it belongs, to turn wherever it wills. And the works of truth and the works of deceit are written upon the hearts of men, and each one of them the Lord knows. And there is no time at which the works of men can be hid, for on the heart itself have they been written down before the Lord. And the spirit of truth testifies all things, and accuses all, and the sinner is burnt up by his own heart, and cannot raise his face to the judge. Now I have much grief, my children, because of your lewdness and witchcrafts, and idolatry which you will practice against the kingdom, following them that have familiar spirits, diviners and demons of error. You will make your daughters singing girls and harlots, and you will practice the abominations of the nations. This grievous prophecy from Judah is interesting considering his previous statement in chapter 18 pertaining to the evils in the last days, as it is a direct parallel to an end times prophecy of John in Revelation 9, 20 through 22. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk, and they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. Therefore, hearken to the spirit of truth, family, and follow not the demons of error or those who obey their teachings. I want to talk today about dimensions of the spiritual combat that we're engaged in. That's one of the reasons why I love the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs so much is there's so much discussion about unclean spirits and how to combat them. Spiritual combat. The spiritual combat. Spiritual combat. Nobody is exempt from spiritual warfare, and it's not something that you just get in the beginning of your walk with God and then it goes away. Like, spiritual warfare is an ongoing thing that's going to continue to happen when you decide to follow Christ. You can fight spiritually as well. It's an all-in war that we're supposed to be waging, and when we start to do that, when we really do that, we get total freedom. The devil knows how important you are for the kingdom of God. Spiritual warfare is a real thing. So the devil's not going to stop trying to attack you. Spiritual combat. Spiritual combat. Where does the fight really occur? To walk in God's will for your life is to learn and do his commandments. That's the ultimate wisdom, the embodiment of knowledge and truth, as Paul calls it in Romans 2. This is the easiest way for you to start walking in the path where then once you're developing and molding your character in the right way, the Father will then start saying, now he's ready for me to bless him in specific ways. You're going to start to get stronger and you're going to start to recognize Satan's tactics. And at the same time, you're guarding your heart against the evil spirits of deceit. The spiritual combat. The spiritual combat. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. You can resist them by doing the commandments of God. Spiritual combat. Spiritual combat. If you do not utilize God's strategy in fighting the enemy, you do not stand a chance. The Father did not give the demons power over you. You have power over them by walking in singleness of heart and doing the commandments of God. Spiritual combat. Where do you get these extra books from? The Testament of Levi? What in the world? And the Testament of Twelve Patriarchs was in the Old Testament canon in the 14th century. They viewed the scripture all that time in our media for 1400 years plus. Uh, but you never heard about it because the Protestants have adopted their canon from the Catholics. And I think it's a very big mistake for the Protestants that they lost the Apocrypha books. Because as you well know, the more we study different Apocrypha books, you find out that they, they don't take away from the Bible. They build a story and give a lot more information and details and make it very colorful indeed. They do. It's the same thing with this new book, The Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs. The more that you learn the Word of God and you renew your mind with the Word, the more that you'll be able to fight off all of the warfare that comes your way. How about a 14th century Armenian Old Testament? The Armenian Orthodox Church. Are they Christians? They're literally martyred and persecuted, genocided for being Christians. 
by their surrounding neighbors in years past. I think they're Christians. Look at these specific books that are unique to their Old Testament. Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, guys. This is a huge deal. Praise God in the great congregation. Praise the Lord in the assembly of Israel. There is the little tribe of Benjamin leading them. There, the great throng of Judah's princes. And there, the princes of Zebulun and of Naphtali. Summon your power, God. Show us your strength, our God, as you have done before. Issachar said you both. The Testament of Issachar is generally centered on the concept of singleness, not in terms of a relationship status, but regarding a sole devotion of mind, heart, and behavior. Unlike most of the other speakers in the Twelve Patriarchs, Issachar claims a relatively unblemished moral life. He credits this in part to his contentment with simple living and fulfillment found in manual labor. In doing so, he encourages his progeny to pursue an uncomplicated, satisfying life. And now hearken to me, my children, and walk in singleness of your heart, for I have seen in it all that is well-pleasing to the Lord. The single-minded man covets not gold, he overreaches not his neighbor, he longs not after manifold dainties, he delights not in varied apparel, he does not desire to live a long life, but only waits for the will of God, and the spirits of deceit have no power against him. For he looks not on the beauty of women, lest he should pollute his mind with corruption. There is no envy in his thoughts, nor worry with insatiable desire in his mind. For he walks in singleness of soul, and beholds all things in uprightness of heart, shunning eyes made evil through the error of the world, lest he should see the perversion of any of the commandments of the Lord. Except my wife, I have not known any woman. I never committed fornication by the uplifting of my eyes. I drank not wine to be led astray thereby. I coveted not any desirable thing that was my neighbor's. Guile arose not in my heart. A lie passed not through my lips. If any man were in distress, I joined my sighs with his, and I shared my bread with the poor. I wrought godliness all my days. I kept truth. I loved the Lord. Likewise also every man with all my heart. So do you also these things, my children, and every spirit of Belial shall flee from you. And no deed of wicked men shall rule over you. And every wild beast you shall subdue, since you have with you the God of heaven and earth and walk with men in singleness of heart. We know that to love the Lord our God and to love our neighbor are the greatest of all the commandments. Doing so in singleness of heart and mind is submitting to the will of God. Like Issachar, who declares that practicing these instructions will empower you against Satan and his spirits, the Apostle James puts it this way. Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Zebulun was the sixth son of Jacob. His text relates what he learned as a result of the plot against his brother Joseph and how he was consequently molded into a compassionate, charity-minded man. Zebulun testifies that obedience to God's instructions and love of one another provided him and his household the blessing of God's protection from illness and injury. And now, my children, I give you to keep the commands of the Lord and to show mercy to your neighbors and to have compassion towards all, not towards men only, but also towards beasts. For all this thing's sake, the Lord blessed me, and when all my brethren were sick, I escaped without sickness, for the Lord knoweth the purpose of each. Have therefore compassion in your hearts, my children, because even as a man doeth to his neighbor, even so also will the Lord do to him. For the sons of my brethren were sickening, and were dying on account of Joseph, because they showed not mercy in their hearts. 
but my sons were preserved without sickness, as ye know. And when I was in the land of Canaan, by the sea coast, I made a catch of fish for Jacob my father, and when many were choked in the sea, I continued unhurt. The ultimate goal of spiritual combat is the future fulfillment of salvation, aka the resurrection to eternal life for all who endure to the end. And Zebulun uplifts his sons with the promise of this event accordingly. And now, my children, grieve not that I am dying, nor be cast down in that I am coming to my end. For I shall rise again in the midst of you, as a ruler in the midst of his sons, and I shall rejoice in the midst of my tribe, as many as shall keep the law of the Lord, and the commandments of Zebulun their father. But upon the ungodly shall the Lord bring eternal fire, and destroy them throughout all generations. But I am now hastening away to my rest, as did also my fathers. But do ye fear the Lord our God with all your strength all the days of your life. If the grand finale of our victory in this fight ends with the ungodly destroyed by fire and those who have kept God's law living forever, then there should be no question of which side of the fight we want to be on. If you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. seventh son of Jacob, the patriarch Dan, treats the topics of anger and lying. Dan insists that a lying tongue and wrathful heart are dangerous to a man's soul and must be avoided, but that walking in peace, truth, and repentance are a defense against the kingdom of the enemy and the warfare he wages against God's people. Observe, therefore, my children, the commandments of the Lord, and keep his law. Depart from wrath, and hate lying, that the Lord may dwell among you, and Belir may flee from you. Speak truth each one with his neighbor. So shall you not fall into wrath and confusion, but you shall be in peace. Having the God of peace, so shall no war prevail over you. Love the Lord through all your life, and one another with a true heart. As established in a previous episode, observing God's commandments and keeping His law is walking in His Spirit. This is how we invite the Spirit of the Lord to dwell among us, causing Satan to run from us, peace to overcome us, and all our wars to be won. Dan continues to caution and comfort his children. And now, fear the Lord, my children, and beware of Satan and his spirits. Draw near to God and to the messenger that intercedes for you, for he is a mediator between God and man, and for the peace of Israel he shall stand up against the kingdom of the enemy. Therefore is the enemy eager to destroy all that call upon the Lord, for he knows that upon the day on which Israel shall repent, the kingdom of the enemy shall be brought to an end. If the enemy is eager to destroy all who call upon the Lord, we must not be ignorant of his schemes. Dan tells us that the repentance of God's people is a weapon capable of decimating Satan's kingdom. Therefore, combatants, turn from your transgressions of God's law. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Naphtali. From Jacob's eighth son, the Testament of Naphtali contains apocalyptic elements and the recurrent theme of obedience to God's commandments being the weapon of our warfare. His message focuses on a respect for the natural order that God has given to all of his creation. So then, my children, let all your works be done in order, with good intent in the fear of God, and do nothing disorderly in scorn or out of its due season. For if thou bid the eye to hear, it cannot. So neither, while ye are in darkness, can ye do the works of light. Be ye therefore not eager to corrupt your doings through covetousness or with vain words to beguile your souls. Because if he keeps silence in purity of heart, he shall understand how to hold fast the will of God and to cast away the will of Belial. Sun and moon and stars change not their order. So do ye also change not the law of God in the disorderliness of your doings. In Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, he summarizes the same point like so. Let no man deceive you with vain words. 
because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Naphtali elaborates. The Gentiles went astray and forsook the Lord and changed their order and obeyed stocks and stones, spirits of deceit. But ye shall not be so, my children, recognizing in the firmament, in the earth, and in the sea, and in all created things, the Lord who made all things, that ye become not as Sodom, which changed the order of nature. In like manner, the watchers also changed the order of their nature, whom the Lord cursed at the flood, on whose account he made the earth without inhabitants and fruitless. This passage from Naphtali is a direct reference to the pre-flood events involving the rebellious watcher angels, also known as the sons of God in Genesis 6, or the angels who sinned in 2 Peter. According to other ancient Israelite scripture, their transgression is what resulted in the creation of unclean spirits. These writings and concepts will be further addressed in future episodes. Naphtali goes on. If ye work that which is good, my children, both men and angels shall bless you. And God shall be glorified among the Gentiles through you. And the devil shall flee from you. And the wild beast shall fear you. And the Lord shall love you. And the angels shall cleave to you. As a man who's trained his child well, is kept in kindly remembrance, so also for a good work there is a good remembrance before God. But him that doeth not that which is good, both angels and men shall curse, and God shall be dishonored among the Gentiles through him, and the devil shall make him as his own peculiar instrument, and every wild beast shall master him, and the Lord shall hate him. For the commandments of the law are twofold, and through prudence must they be fulfilled. The book of Tobit, which was included in the original 1611 King James Bible, contains a fun fact in its prologue, informing the reader that Tobit was from the tribe of Naphtali. It's no wonder that he repeats the same teachings of his forefather. It is good to keep close the secret of a king, but it is honorable to reveal the works of God. Do that which is good, and no evil shall touch you. your destiny. Death, yes, sir. The Testament of Gad begins with Gad confessing the hatred he had for Joseph in his youth. He exhorts his seed to put away hatred from their heart, likening it to a poison that kills the one who hates, and places great importance on the act of repentance of all transgressions of God's law. For the spirit of hatred works together with Satan through hastiness of spirit in all things to men's death. But the spirit of love works together with the law of God in long suffering unto the salvation of men. For true repentance after a godly sort destroys ignorance and drives away the darkness and enlightens the eyes and gives knowledge to the soul and leads the mind to salvation. And those things which it hasn't learned from man, it knows through repentance. Here we find yet another example of how the Apostle Paul would have likely been familiar with these writings, as he echoes the same sentiments about repentance and salvation. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. Lastly, Gad leaves us with an inspiring statement for anyone who struggles with anxiety, stress, or inner conflict. Seek out the judgments of the Lord, and your mind will rest and be at peace. The Testament of Asher is the shortest of the twelve, and unlike the others, does not begin with a deathbed scene. Asher's focus is delineating the two ways to live, in truth or in error, with his appeal being to follow the truth with singleness of faith. Therefore, if the soul takes pleasure in the good inclination, all its actions are in righteousness, and if it sins, it straightway repents. For having its thoughts set upon righteousness and casting away wickedness, it straightaway overthrows the evil and uproots the sin. But if it incline to the evil inclination, all its actions are in wickedness, and it drives away the good and cleaves to the evil and is ruled by Beliar. Take heed, therefore, 
you also, my children, to the commandments of the Lord, following the truth with singleness of face. For they that are double-faced are guilty of a twofold sin, for they both do the evil thing, and they have pleasure in them that do it, following the example of the spirits of deceit and striving against mankind. Do ye therefore, my children, keep the law of the Lord, and don't give heed unto evil as unto good, but look to the thing that is really good, and keep it in all commandments of the Lord, having your conversation therein and resting therein. A later prophet of Abrahamic lineage, Joshua, repeats the same thought with a promise of prosperity in your endeavors. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Choose your destiny. Joseph Benjamin. Eleventh son of Jacob, the Testament of Joseph places an emphasis on chastity and is based on Joseph's resistance against Potiphar's wife that the book of Genesis portrays. He adds detail to this narrative, recounting how she resorted to extreme measures, including spell casting and love potions, in her effort to seduce Joseph. In his testament, Joseph emboldens his children to pursue sexual purity as a means to avoid evil and to surrender to God's ways to find his favor in the combat arena. For the Lord doth not forsake them that fear him, neither in darkness, nor in bonds, nor in tribulations, nor in necessities. For God is not put to shame as a man, nor as the son of man is he afraid, nor as one that is earth-born is he weak or affrighted. But in all those things doth he give protection, and in diverse ways doth he comfort, though for a little space he departeth to try the inclination of the soul. In ten temptations he showed me approved, and in all of them I endured, for endurance is a mighty charm, and patience giveth many good things. But that thou mayst learn that the wickedness of the ungodly hath no power over them that worship God with chastity. Ye see, therefore, my children, how great things patience worketh, and prayer with fasting. So ye too, if ye follow after chastity and purity with patience and prayer, with fasting and humility of heart, the Lord will dwell among you, because he loveth chastity. And wheresoever the Most High dwelleth, even though envy or slavery or slander befalleth a man, the Lord who dwelleth in him, for the sake of his chastity, not only delivereth him from evil, but also exalteth him even as me. In today's world of hypersexualized culture and perverse lusts, the virtues of chastity, abstinence before marriage, and fidelity are all but a long-lost ethic of ancient cultures. However, the patriarch Joseph urges his readers to believe that this sort of self-restraint and purity will ensure the indwelling of God's spirit and deliverance from evil. Rightfully so, our Father loves his obedient children. Do ye also, my children, have the fear of God in all your works before your eyes, and honor your brethren. For every one who doeth the law of the Lord shall be loved by him. Benjamin was the twelfth and youngest of his father's sons. His testament is very much an appendix to that of Joseph, who served as a heroic brotherly example to Benjamin. He exhorts his descendants with these instructions. Do you also, therefore, my children, love the Lord God of heaven and earth, and keep his commandments, following the example of the good and holy man Joseph? And let your mind be unto good, even as you know me. For he that has his mind right sees all things rightly. Fear you the Lord, and love your neighbor. And even though the spirits of Beliar claim you to afflict you with every evil, yet shall they not have dominion over you even as they had not over Joseph my brother. How many men wished to slay him, and God shielded him? For he that fears God and loves his neighbor cannot be smitten by the spirit of Beliah, being shielded by the fear of God. Nor can he be ruled over by the device of men or beasts, for he is helped by the Lord through the love which he has towards his neighbor. And though they devise with evil intent concerning him, by doing good he overcometh evil, being shielded by God. This is yet another instance that indicates how first century Christians would have had the knowledge of these writings. Given that the Apostle Paul was from the tribe of Benjamin, it's appropriate that he would go on to reference this same idea in Romans 12, 21. Do not be overcome by evil, 
but overcome evil with good. Overcoming evil with good is the overall theme of this consistent narrative we see throughout scripture. Real spiritual warfare is not always a glamorous spectacle of an event that some might expect. It doesn't require ritual incantations, repetitive mantras, or special talismans. It is simply driving away darkness by shining the light of all that God says is good and righteous. If you do well, even the unclean spirits will flee from you, and the beasts will dread you. For where there is reverence for good works and light in the mind, even darkness flees away from him. Deliverance from demonic oppression and the influence of their deception is not an overnight success story for everyone, but we do have a guide to see us through it. And the best way to know that we are following his lead is to study and know his word. Be a student of scripture, fellow combatants. At every opportunity, analyze your beliefs, your words, and your behaviors, making the necessary adjustments to walk in the paths of uprightness outlined by our Father's prophets. This is the good fight you are called to fight in. Good fight you are called to fight in. Fight you are called to fight in. Choose your destiny. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah. It's a call. Set me alone. Dad. Now Tommy. Ken. Esther. Joseph. Benjamin. Because all the 12 brothers, the sons of Jacob, they're all very different. What I find especially exciting is that they all prophesied about Messiah. The Testament of 12 Patriarchs was an ancient Israelite literature they had and considered as a part of their scrolls. It was actually left out in the first century AD and not put in the Jewish canon. But there is a direct wording in the Talmud of Rabbi Akiva talking about these particular outside writings that were giving Christians proof of Christ. So he intentionally wanted to remove them from the canon, as it used to be a part of the Israelite literature before the first century AD and rabbinic Judaism stepped in and started editing books from the canon based on bias through the calendars and Christ. You're going to find some verses in here that are absolutely incredible. I mean, wow, I've never seen such verses before about the Messiah. They actually described in detail how the Messiah would be betrayed by his own people and they will kill their own messiah. Wow, they say that. This is predicted by the patriarchs in the same way as talked about by the psalmist King David and the book of Isaiah and the prophets. Look at all these different books in here. And I highlighted for you the ones that are unique to this canon, showing you it's different from what the Jews of Judaism considered canon. Since when do Christians take their cues from people that, that deny the Father and the Son? Since when do Christians take their biblical hermeneutic lens about covenants and what is divinely inspired, when do we ever take our cues from people that beat Christ in the face and killed him as a murdered righteous prophet? If you know apocryphal books like the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, you will come to know your Bible much better. Once you study this book and you study what the Twelve Sons of Jacob actually said, you will see the Pharisees had nothing to do with this book because it speaks directly against them. It speaks against their perfidity and their corruption and their evil ways. But you've got to read the book to see this. But they also state, oh, one day the nation of Israel would embrace their Messiah, as mentioned in the book of Zechariah. Salvation is not a game. God's plan of salvation, those who are opposed to him, and each of our choices in the matter are very much the reality we live in. And the stakes are eternal life or death. Thankfully, there is one who is appointed to lead us through this warfare, and if we don't recognize our need for his position of authority over us, all hope is lost for our individual survival in the fight. Let it therefore strengthen our faith to know that even the sons of Jacob in their day were well aware of messianic prophecy. Simeon says this, And now, my children, obey Levi and Judah, and do not be lifted up against these two tribes. For from them the salvation of God will arise to you. For Yahweh will raise up from Levi, as it were a high priest. 
and from Judah, as it were, a king, God and man. He will save all the nations and the race of Israel. This promise that an eternal king, high priest, and savior would arise through the tribes of Judah and Levi is reiterated multiple times in the Testaments of the Twelve. And though they instructed their family to be mindful that the Christ would come, Levi delivers this grim prophecy. And now I have learned that for seventy weeks ye shall go astray, and profane the priesthood, and pollute the sacrifices, and ye shall make void the law, and set at naught the words of the prophets by evil perverseness. And ye shall persecute righteous men, and hate the godly. The words of the faithful shall ye abhor. And a man who reneweth the law in the power of the Most High, ye shall call a deceiver. And at last ye shall rush upon him to slay him, not knowing his dignity, taking innocent blood through wickedness upon your heads. And your holy places shall be laid waste even to the ground because of him. And ye shall have no place that is clean, but he shall be among the Gentiles a curse and a dispersion until he shall again visit you, and in pity shall receive you. Shall receive you. Judah follows up with this prophetic reassurance. And after these things shall a star arise to you from Jacob in peace, and a man shall arise from my seed, like the son of righteousness, walking with the sons of men in meekness and righteousness. And no sin shall be found in him, and the heavens shall be open unto him to pour out the Spirit, even the blessing of the Holy Father. And he shall pour out the Spirit of grace upon you, and you shall be unto him sons in truth. And you shall walk in his commandments, first and last, this branch of God most high, and this fountain giving life unto all. Then shall the scepter of my kingdom shine forth, and from your root shall arise a stem, and from it shall grow a rod of righteousness to the nations, to judge and to save all that call upon the Lord. The patriarch Dan tells of how our Lord would serve as the perfect example for obedience to the Father's instructions. And the things which you have heard from your Father, do you also impart to your children that the Savior of the Gentiles may receive you? For he is true and long-suffering, meek and lowly, and teaches by his works the law of God. And there shall arise unto you from the tribe of Judah and of Levi the salvation of the Lord, and he shall make war against Beliar, and execute an everlasting vengeance on our enemies. The beloved Joseph proclaims the gospel of the kingdom while telling his sons about our king. Hear ye, therefore, my vision which I saw. And I saw in the midst of the horns a virgin, wearing a many-colored garment, and from her went forth a lamb, and on his right was as it were a lion. And all the beasts and all the reptiles rushed against him, and the Lamb overcame them and destroyed them. And these things must come to pass in their season. Do ye therefore, my children, observe the commandments of the Lord, and honor Levi and Judah. For from them shall arise unto you the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sin of the world, one who saveth all the Gentiles and Israel. For his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, which shall not pass away, which shall not pass away. Benjamin foretells of how the Anointed One would die, be resurrected, and ascend into heaven. Nevertheless, the temple of God shall be in your portion, and the last temple shall be more glorious than the first, and the twelve tribes shall be gathered together there, and all the Gentiles until the Most High shall send forth his salvation in the visitation of an only begotten prophet. And he shall enter into the temple, and there shall the Lord be treated with outrage, and he shall be lifted up upon a tree. And the veil of the temple shall be rent, and the Spirit of God shall pass on to the Gentiles as fire poured forth. And he shall ascend from Hades, and shall pass from earth into heaven. And I know how lowly he shall be upon earth, and how glorious in heaven. As you can see, his divinity, the virgin birth, his genealogy, his life, death, resurrection, priesthood, his second coming, and eternal kingdom are all prophetically described in great detail through these books. Only one man fulfills each of these prophecies. That man is Jesus the Christ, Yeshua of Nazareth. These passages were just a sliver of the wealth of information presented in the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs. I encourage you to get to know these writings, as they will help you to better understand the Bible you're familiar with. They present an accurate record of the history of our faith, and they will point you to the quintessential strategy that God has given mankind to participate in spiritual combat. 
my sincerest gratitude to everyone who has given ear to this message. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you, and my love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Yeah! Yeah!